and welcome to the September 2018 edition of City Connection. This is the live call-in program where you citizens of Grand Rapids can talk with your mayor, learn about local issues, ask your questions. Grand Rapids Mayor Rosalind Bliss is in studio live today and we'll cover a number of city-related topics. We'll take your questions later in the show. Today we also welcome to the GRTV studios uh, Wendy Ogilvie. She's with Lower Grand River Organization of Watersheds, or LGRO, and we'll learn a little bit about the mission of that organization in their work connecting water with life. We'll talk about uh, some of the river restoration efforts that are going on, some things to do with water here in Grand Rapids, and even the mayor's river cleanup that happened this past weekend. You have opportunity as well. We'll give you that information later in the show to call, ask your mayor questions, and even our guest, Wendy Ogilvie. City Connection, we're broadcasting live today, September 10th, 2018, here at GRTV Community Media Center's Livewire Channel 24. And now with Community Media Center, I'm Linda Galash, and welcome to the studio, Rosalind Bliss. Thank you. It's good to be back. Mayor, it's, yeah. it's ball here, and we've got a lot going on. Um, we sort of mentioned a little bit about your river cleanup. We'll leave that mm -hmm. to last since we'll bring that up right before right. we bring Wendy in the studio, but a yeah. lot going on here in Grand Rapids. Yes, <laughs> I know. You know. I thought I thought the fall would slow down a little bit, and that has just not proven to be the case. I think summer teed up fall. Maybe <laughs> that's that's how it went. I think um, so. We've got a bunch of things I've been reading about that yeah. the city's involved in, so I think yeah. I'll just kind of start rattling off a few of them. And okay. one of them is that you mentioned um, the dash. It's been rebranded last month, and also there's a yeah. free route, a shuttle in the downtown yeah. area. So tell us the new things about the dash. Yeah, it was really exciting. We've actually been working on this, uh, the, the rebranding and rerouting of the dash for about uh, eight months to a year, getting a lot of feedback from the community and businesses. Uh, and we heard pretty loud and clear a few things. We, we heard from the community that they wanted weekend service. Uh, and so now the dash runs on the weekends, uh, 10 a.m. till actually 1 a.m. Uh, so you can, if you have a hard time finding, if there's, especially if there's a big event downtown, if you have a hard time finding parking, you can park at a dash lot and take the dash in at no cost. Uh, we also rebranded it, uh, the color and the whole um, visual of the dash. So instead of seeing the blue buses around town, the dash is bright pink, so you really can't miss it. Uh, so that was part of the rebranding. And then also we took a look at the routes and identified areas where people said they really wanted the dash to go. And then we, um, so we decided to have an east-west route and then a north-south route. Uh, and then we increased how often they circulate. So all of that is new. Um, we have all the signs up where you can get on the dash and then you just pull the cord when you want to jump off. It's really, really easy to use. Uh, and I hope people will at least try it. You know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people and, um, you know, if you're downtown and you want to get out to the downtown market for lunch, try the dash. It's super easy to use uh, and very accessible. And then coupled with the dash reroute, we also started the fare free uh, Route 19. Uh, so you can jump on Route 19, which is the uh, rapid bus that goes right here, down here on Bridge Street, um, at the Bridge Street Market, goes straight up Michigan all the way out to Plymouth. And that is on a 10 minute rotation. So every 10 minutes, you can jump on the rapid, um, go up and down Michigan Street, and again, at no cost. So we're, we're seeing the Route 19 route um, along Michigan Mile. Uh, we're really seeing that as kind of an extension of the dash route. So uh, that's what we're going for, uh, and we're hoping that people will use it. We've already seen a significant uptick in Route 19 ridership. I think last week I heard that it was averaging, I think, 900 rides a day, um, up from just a couple hundred. So we're hoping more people try it, see that it's really easy and accessible, um, and that that will also help with traffic on Michigan. Although traffic right here when you get onto bridge is really tricky. And that's a new thing too. So yes. it's just going to exponentially keep on increasing. Identifying Route 19 is an area that's had a huge growth. Where yeah. do you see the next area of growth that uh, may be looking for some more expansion? Yeah, so, uh, so a couple things happening with transit. Um, we're in the process right now moving forward with the Laker line. So we're hoping to actually break ground really soon on that. That line will go all the way from Michigan up by the GVSU campus up there and it'll run um, down Monroe and then down um, Fulton. It'll cut across on Fulton and then go all the way out to Allendale. So if you park at an outlet or you live close to Walker, you can take, you'll soon be able to take the Laker line in if that's your choice. And that will act uh, sil similar to the Silver Line, so that'll be a BRT line. And then we're in the process right now of doing an analysis for a potential third BRT line. Uh, and that goes through all of the federal requirements and analysis to see if 
if you know it's feasible um, based on density and population and need. So lots of uh, initials in there. Mm -hmm. um, we've got DASH, we've got BRT, we've got the RAPID. Does it really matter the difference in all of those or is there a, a source, a single source to kind of get all the information you need on that? <laughs> That's a great question. I should stop using acronyms. <laughs> um, so you can always go to the RAPID, uh, their website, or you can go to the city's uh, mobile GR website. Um, DASH is the downtown area shuttle, uh, so that's what the DASH stands for, and it's, and it's meant to operate that way, like a shuttle, and be very quick. Uh, and then BRT is bus rapid transit, so that is the silver line that goes up and down um, division, uh, which is multi-jurisdictional, so it goes through a number of cities. Uh, and then that's all coordinated um, through the rapid. So even though the DASH, the city pays for that out of our mobile GR department, we contract with the rapid to um, provide the service for the DASH. Okay, thanks for that. Um, newest updates on that. Yes. It seems like almost every time we talk there's a little bit new yeah. on that. You know, one other thing I should say about the RAPID is we have a new CEO, Andrew Johnson. So he started just three weeks ago and I know we, I think we're going to get him on the show right. um, at some point uh, and hopefully you'll have a chance to meet him. He comes to us from Illinois. He has a lot of experience, over 20 years of experience um, in the field of transit, but he has a very innovative, creative perspective about the future of transit and the need to um, shift to mobility on demand and how do you have a system that really meets the, the varying needs of people throughout the community. And so there will be a lot of discussions as he, uh, you know, kind of gets his foundation under him and starts to have conversations about, you know, what are we doing really well um, with our current transit system, where do we need to improve and then how do we get there. That'll be a great conversation. I look yeah. forward to having him on the program. We'll yeah. talk to him sometime soon. All right, we're going to jump through a few different things. How about neighborhood matching funds? Been the latest yeah. release of uh, awarded grants. Yes. So um, please take a look at those. We, I personally, I love this program. I know we've talked about it right. before on this program. Uh, and this is a way for neighbors to identify projects they want to do in their neighborhood and then to have some financial resources to back it up and make it happen. Uh, and so we're doing quarterly rounds of that. We increased the funding for that last year during our budget process. Uh, and we love to see the projects that come out of that, especially the ones that are driven um, and facilitated by youth. All right. Yeah. Well, I, saw, I was just going through a little bit of a list of some of those, and a couple of them had to do with urban farming, mm -hmm. urban gardening. One had to do with a historical music project uh, yeah. centering on East Hills and Baxter neighborhood yeah. area. And then uh, another one I thought was pretty interesting was a fix-it fair and a yeah. few different things like that. So the list is on the city's yeah. website. It looked like awarding around $22,000 mm -hmm. this round. So yeah. some great new projects. Not yeah. only do um, I look forward to take part in some of these. So that's yeah. exciting. It is exciting. And, uh, and I just want to remind everyone that um, the committee, it's a, it's a committee of citizens that help us decide those awards. Uh, and then those recommendations are made um, formally to the city commission. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, how about the latest on community and police relations? There's uh, mm -hmm. some de dedicated funds. There's been discussion yeah. on how those funds will be, will be used. How's <coughs> that coming along? Yeah, so we had, the City Commission had a pretty lengthy work session uh, where we covered a whole host of issues related to um, public safety and community police relations, including crisis intervention teams and um, community policing, um, deployment and staffing, um, violence prevention programs, gun violence prevention, uh, and the City Commission decided, we made a couple decisions. One, we decided to wait until the um, work is done with 21st Century Policing, which is our task force, uh, and that work is going to complete in October. We actually have an update from Ron Davis, who is the lead for the task force. He's here tomorrow, so he'll be presenting to the City Commission. And then in October, it'll be the final meeting, and October 8th will be a report out on the final recommendations from that body of work. So. The City Commission decided we're going to hold off on any question related to adding staffing until we get that report. Um, and then we would also move forward on a study to look at overall deployment and staffing, which was one of the preliminary recommendations and the Chief was supportive of that as well. So we move forward on that. Um, we're continuing to have conversations with Network 180 in the county and some of our other partners in the community around how do we respond more effectively to individuals um, who have a serious mental illness and who have a substance abuse disorder mm -hmm. through a model called crisis intervention teams or SIT teams. So we're exploring that right now. Um, we're moving forward on an analysis for implementation of an evidence-based violence prevention program with a target towards um, preventing gun violence and getting guns off the street. So we decided to move forward with those efforts 
uh, and then hold off until we have the final recommendation from 21st century as we move forward on the, as we look at staffing. So those were those are kind of the big issues that we discussed and decided on. And just for an, um, kind of an assessment of where things are now versus a year ago, the kinds of activity yeah. that um, are police calls, police incidents, police yeah. um, crime incidents in the city, what are we seeing? And usually after a summer there's a little bit of a, um, a change in the type of activity that goes on yeah. after summer or, or during yeah. summer. You know, I haven't seen the, the final um, crime stats for the last quarter, but I know that our, our violent crime continues to, to go down. That's true in a lot of cities, um, and we're really fortunate, knock on wood, that that continues to be the case here. I can tell you that in the last year, um, the department has worked really hard to develop relationships um, within the community. So you're seeing, even this past summer, a lot of work that our officers did out in the community, connecting with youth, through baseball and through the Boys and Girls Club. The chief um, is, is continuing his youth advisory committee and actually he's taking applications for that right now. His impact, his imp he calls it impact, but it's a youth advisory. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a, there's a real commitment to continuing that work and we know it doesn't happen overnight and it takes a long time. So some really good progress is being made, um, but clearly we still have a lot of work to do. Okay. Yeah. I always look forward to hearing more on that. And another um, item I wanted to hit before we um, get into the next election day, and we were just uh, broadcast last time the day before the primaries. Mm -hmm. How did it go? Um, how did yeah. things go from the viewpoint of the city clerk's office? We're going to have city clerk in yeah. uh, this studio maybe next month. How did it yeah. go during the primary election last month? Yeah, so it was our clerk's first mm -hmm. um, election as clerk, and I would say overall it was pretty successful. Um, we had a couple hiccups. Uh, a couple of our precincts, we ran really low on ballots, mm -hmm. but we were able to get more ballots to those precincts before we ran out. So we technically did not run out. Um, the positive of that is that we had an exceptionally high turnout for a primary election. Uh, so that was wonderful. We just didn't have a... Uh, we didn't base our ballot count on, on the potential increase in voter turnout. We based it on years past. Um, and, then, and then I think overall things went really well. I, I think there were a couple of hiccups and they were responded to very, very quickly. The clerk was out and about all day. Um, I know he got to about 45% of the precincts himself. Uh, and I think he made a long list of items he wants to see improved for the November election. Okay, well it is our hope that we have it. Joel? Yep, Hondorp. Hondorp. So yeah. His first election was uh, last month, and we'll have him in the studio next month. We'll talk a little bit about the November elections then and see uh, what he learned from that first one and where we <laughs> see we're going with the next one. Yeah. Um, let's see if I have anything else before we take our quick break. I actually think um, uh, one thing I wanted to bring up is now is the time that it's open for the September 18th, Our City Academy, and that's a great program yes. you've talked about before, and it's yeah. for newcomers to the city. Tell yeah. a little bit more about that. Yeah, so this is uh, um, this is another program that I really love. It's in partnership with Grand Rapids Public Schools, and this is a um, four-session program uh, where folks who are new Grand Rapidians can come and learn all about city government, um, how to be engaged in the city, learn about our school system, uh, look at the different opportunities that, that families have for children in our schools, uh, and really provide a space for them to ask questions uh, and learn about our community and, and really feel uh, welcomed and feel like they belong. So, so is this a day long, an evening long event, and where do you register? Yeah, so you can go to the city's website and register. So just go to, um, no, I should have written this down. I'll have to get you the website. Okay. I, um, because I don't know what web page it's on, but if you go to the city website and punch in and just put in the our search, city Our City Academy, you'll okay. pull it up. Um, but I should know that off the top of my head, and I'm sorry I don't. Um, and it's four, it's four different sessions, and they are over multiple weeks, okay. so they're spread out. Um, but it's very accessible. We provide food. We have a lot of great speakers. Uh, our chief comes in, actually our fire chief and police chief. Um, we talk about city services. We talk about how to set up accounts. We talk about voting. So the city clerk goes and talks about um, where to go to vote, how to, how to register to vote. So it's a lot Excellent. of good information. Okay. Well, we're going to break now, and when we come back, we'll be with us with uh, Wendy Ogilvie. She's with the Lower Grand River Organization of Watersheds. We'll learn a little bit about Elgro next. We'll be right back.
everybody. My name is Sarah Jean Anderson, and I'm a proud CYC board member. At the Creative Youth Center, we believe in empowering the youth of Grand Rapids by supporting their writing and amplifying their voices. We are so excited to be celebrating the beginning of another wonderful school year, providing free after-school creative writing programs to students in the Grand Rapids area. Registration is currently open for all GRPS students. Non-GRPS students will be able to register on September 4th, and all programs for our students will begin on September 17th. We have so much fun stuff in store for you this school season, including the return of our student-written comedy show, The Characters That Lived, as well as a brand new storytelling event this October, hosted by me, Sarah Jean. As always, for more information, you can head over to creativeyouthcenter.org for our calendar, event info, and to donate, because we couldn't do this without the help of our community partners. Another way you can help us is by purchasing our annually published anthology of student work, The Book of Explosions. Creative Youth Center's merchandise and books can be purchased at Books and Mortar and Schuler Bookstores across Grand Rapids, with proceeds going right back into our programming. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to see what we've been up to. On behalf of the CYC, have a fantastic school year, everybody. The Rapidian for the community provides an alternative to be the eyes of somebody who's not there. It's more honest, more authentic, and more true. And you do have the freedom to talk about things because they're things that need to be talked about, not because they'll get readers or viewers or clicks. Sometimes it feels intimidating to write a news story or, or to write a story about a, a community issue. What I love about the Rapidian is that they make it really simple and easy. So it's not like you have to meet this deadline by this time. I'll be eating a sandwich in one hand and then I'm like typing in the other. I love the freedom to be able to write from wherever. I think it's a really powerful experience when people are able to tell their story and to be heard. Anyone can have a voice. Anybody can speak. It's a platform for the community to tell its own story in a very authentic way and that's powerful. The community has to be involved in order for it to be sustainable. And so it tells you something about our community. Well, welcome back. We are happy to have with us today Wendy Ogilvie, who is the, I want to make sure I get her title right, Director of Environmental Programs at Grand Valley Metro Council. I've had the joy to work with Wendy for several years now. I serve on the Metro Council Board. Uh, and then you oversee Elgro, so I'm going to have you talk about okay. that. Um, mm -hmm. I was saying as I was walking in that I feel like um, both Grand Valley Metro Council and Elgro, you do a lot of work that goes unseen and unnoticed, mm -hmm. um, that you have a lot of, uh, I, sh I want to say tentacles out in the community, <laughs> but it's probably not the right word. Connections. Um, yeah. connections. <laughs> uh, and you're doing a lot of incredible work, even with us at the city around river restoration um, and the watershed. And so I'm so glad you could join us today. So for people who have no idea what the Metro Council is or what Elgro stands for or what Elgro does, why don't we start there? Good place to start. Yeah. Um, so as, as you said, I'm Director of Environmental Programs at the Grand Valley Metro Council, which is an alliance of local governments in West Michigan. And so the Metro Council has three departments. We have the Environmental Programs Department. Uh, we have the Transportation Department that has the, muni the Municipal Planning Organization, so they do the transportation planning for all its members. And then we also have Regis, which is the Regional GIS, which does the mapping and um, sort of keeps track of all the utilities and, and different mapping things for, for the communities that are members also. So it's, it's um, very, it, it, has, it does a lot, but you're right, a lot of people don't know what Metro Council is. Um, so when I came on board, it was about 2013, so I've been there about five years now to start the environmental programs. And the Lower Grand River Organization of Watersheds is a very long name, so we call <laughs> it Elgro. Um, so that's, that was 
al already going on and it was kind of housed at Metro Council, but they really didn't have any staff to keep it going. So it was a very volunteer, you know, kind of struggling along. Um, did a lot of things, but still needed a kind of a face. And so being um, hired at, at Metro Council, being able to sort of be the staff person of Elgro, uh, really we were able to elevate it. And so we have a board, and right now the chair of the board is Carrie Rivette, who is uh, the city's stormwater superintendent. So we appreciate that involvement from the city. Um, and so what Elgro is, is to, it's sort of the umbrella organization for all of the watersheds in the Lower Grand. Uh, we have great partnerships with the Middle Grand and the Upper Grand because the Grand River actually starts as a little spring in Jackson <laughs> and flows 252 miles to its mouth in Grand Haven, and which is a very, very, very large yeah. watershed to we, manage all at once. And a lot of people don't know it's the longest river in the state of it Michigan. Is. It is the yes. longest river, and so it is truly grand. Yes. So we, uh, you know, it's a very different river when it comes out of the spring in Jackson than it is as it goes through these you know, metropolitan areas and so we, we partner with these other organizations to make sure that we're talking to each other and we're coordinating programs but our our role is really to manage the lower grand and it's from the eastern edge of Ionia County so where the Looking Glass River comes in and the Maple River comes in sort of that uh, juncture right at Portland so it's kind of what we we have a little bit of overlap but that's really our our boundary and then the watershed encompasses uh, the Lower Grand, it encompasses some other large watersheds like the Thorn Apple, which runs into the Grand, and the Rogue River that runs into the Grand, um, Flat River, Indian so Creek, Indi Indian Mill Creek. <laughs> so all of those are tributaries that run into the Grand, and they all outlet at Grand Haven. So we actually have 31 defined watersheds that we use as we call them sort of our management units or our sub watersheds. So we work with a lot of partners as you said, um, and some, some of the partners are very organized, and so like the Rogue River Watershed Partners and Plaster Creek Stewards, um, so they, they've, they've been able to organize people in their watersheds and, and really focus on the issues of their watersheds. So our role is to really help build the capacity of those sub-basins, like for example, Indian Mill Creek, we're working with the citizens there, um, the businesses, the stakeholders in that watershed, um, been working with them about three years to really oh. generate interest, identify the needs, still looking for that local champion to <laughs> step up and really take it over. But that's our role is to really help the capacity of these groups. Yeah. Well, I know about Indian Mill Creek because I cleaned it up on Saturday. Yay, <laughs> so thank you. That's where my thank bus you. was sent yes, to. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a okay. minute. Um, so, so you, under that umbrella, in addition to um, building capacity mm -hmm. and supporting, you do a lot of education as well as uh, you're not just education, but you're out um, mm -hmm. advocating for different issues, mm -hmm. working with schools. Why don't you talk a little bit about all of the different things sure. that you're engaged in? So, and, and maybe it would help. So our, our staff, uh, which we have a really great staff right now, uh, we have Kara Decker, who is our stormwater coordinator. So we also, our role as this um, sort of community alliance and, and working with all the municipalities, we help facilitate all of the stormwater permits yeah. that the 23 communities in the Lower Grand are required to have. And so uh, it's, it's a group, originally we applied under a watershed permit that the Department of Environmental Quality offered. Um, they really liked working together, sharing resources, and so that, that is one of our large programs with all the municipalities together working. So they can have one public education plan, one illicit discharge plan. Um, so that, that's one of our bigger programs. But then we also have an education coordinator, and that's Eileen Bokestein. And you cleaned up mm -hmm. the river with her, I think, <laughs> and her kids. I did. Um, so we've been, uh, we write a lot of grants, mm -hmm. and it's not only for our sub-watersheds, but some of our programs that we implement on, on our own. So we do a lot of education. Um, right now, we have some interesting uh, sort of different types of education. We have one where we're partnering with uh, communities and, and our partners in the Rogue River and Indian Mill Creek, uh, but there's a, there's a farm called Plainsong Farm. And mm -hmm. so we're bringing um, urban kids out to the farm, but also the rural kids so they can, they can kind of mix and mm -hmm. interact with each other, but just having them all understand where their food comes from and getting them engaged. It's a small farm, it's only about 11 acres, and they've been really open to having kids out mm -hmm. there and learning. They, they do plant their garlic for yeah. them and things like that. Oh. Um, but it's just having them understand, getting their hands dirty and understanding how a farm works and how food grows. Um, so that, that's a really uh, going to be a fun project. 
so bringing those schools together. Um, within the municipal permits, the stormwater permits, they also have a public education plan. And so we work with the schools, uh, which helps the municipalities because it's, it's all these students learning about stormwater, what they have to do with stormwater. And so the first thing they do is look at their school campuses and they try to figure out, first of all, where does the water come from? You know, rain, snow, wherever, and then where does it go? So they look at all of their catch basins because a lot of them, they have no idea where their water yeah. goes. A lot of times it goes in the catch basin, then it's out of mind. So we're teaching them that that goes directly to the river, which is one of the city's mm -hmm. big programs as well. It doesn't go to a treatment facility. Yeah. So what can they do on their campus, in their school, to help clean the water before it gets into that catch basin yeah. and then making sure they understand where it all goes. So yeah. we work with a lot of the schools under those permits. Um, but then we also have grants uh, right now. Elgro has a rainscaping program. And it's, you know, we're working with the municipalities mm -hmm. to put green infrastructure yeah. to sort of manage stormwater where it falls. Um, and, but that's on your own properties and with developments. So we're yeah. reaching out to residents. Yeah. And so this program, we have a grant right now that allows us to go out. People can just sign up through our website to do a site assessment. And we'll come out and look at your property um, and, and see what might work for green infrastructure. Maybe they have an area that's always wet. Maybe they get runoff from a neighbor. There's something happening. So we'll assess their property and then give advice, um, give recommendations for green infrastructure and hopefully share on some of that cost. Great. Well, that is a good That's spot all. to pause. Okay. Um, but we, we, before we finish up this segment, uh, maybe end with if individuals are interested in signing up for that program, mm -hmm. uh, what number do they call? What sure. email do they um, email? So first is our website, um, elgro.org. And on there, you can search for rainscaping. And so we have a, a sign up right there that you can do. You can always call our office, which is 616-776-7605. Uh, we're on Facebook at elgro.org, so we do try to share a lot of events and with all of our partners around the watershed. Uh, Instagram, which is elgro underscore org, and then Twitter at elgro. Nice. Uh, so we try to do a lot of social media out that way. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Well, I know that that is just a snapshot of the great work that you're doing, so <laughs> we'll get to a little bit more of it in the next section. So That's with that, good. we'll take a little right. break. Thanks. Join the Rapidian this month for our first community journalism workshop of the season. On Thursday, September 27th, from 12 to 1.30 p.m., our first fall workshop will be held at the Grand Rapids Public Library main branch. If you've always wanted to learn more about community journalism or how to write your story, this is the session for you. We will be going in-depth about community journalism, news and storytelling, and publishing on the website. Whether you are new to the process or a regular contributor, this will be an opportunity to learn about the process at the Rapidian and to connect with other citizen journalists and members of the media. $10 secures your spot and includes lunch and supplies for the session. This will be an interactive session. The Rapidian.org is a community journalism news source intended to increase the flow of local news and information in the Grand Rapids community and its neighborhoods. By providing tools, training, platforms, and support, we empower neighborhood residents to report the news from the inside out. We are an outlet for Grand Rapidians to become more than just content consumers, but also providers by becoming citizen journalists. Looking forward to seeing you at our upcoming session on September 27th at the Grand Rapids Public Library main branch. Register and learn more at therapidian.org or by finding The Rapidian on Facebook or Twitter. Welcome back to City Connection. Uh, Wendy, Roslyn, great conversation there. Yeah. We'll just pursue it a little bit farther. Wendy, thanks for explaining where uh, Grand Valley Metro Council and Elgrove gets in a little confusing. It, there's a lot yes. going on yes. there. Yes. Uh, I was just thinking about with all the heavy rains we had, and we had some mm -hmm. really intense rains that came fast, mm -hmm. uh, brings up the program called Basin Buddies. And can either or both of you tell me a little bit more about that? All right. 
I'll let you sure. talk about it. Okay, it's it's um it's a great city program oh. that um, we try to promote all the time because. As I was talking about storm drains, people have them right outside their homes. They don't always know where they go or what their function is. Um, but when it rains, they find out pretty quickly that they are supposed to drain uh, the rainwater. Um, but a lot of other things get washed down the street. Um, sometimes people put leaves in their in their gutters, thinking the city will pick them up, um, which we don't. Which they don't. <laughs> so I'm always reminding uh, people right, that. Right, <laughs> right. So they, you know, they they clog the storm drain, and then what happens is it floods, the street floods, and that can get into people's basements as well. So the the Basin Buddy is a great program to try to educate residents about just things they can do to help their neighborhood. And so you can adopt a storm drain and you can actually, the, the map that they have on the site is interactive so you can look on the site, you know, you can type in your address, look on the site, see if there's any catch basins near your home and then you can actually adopt them. You can name them whatever you want <laughs> and then it changes the color so you know and you can adopt more than one and some people just, you know, have a whole street that they want to take care of. So before rain comes and there was some um, public yeah. announcements uh, that the city put out, if they know a big rain is coming, just go out there and maybe rake up the leaves, clean it, make sure it's clear so the stormwater can go in there. Okay, yeah. so it's trying to make sure that it's free of any of that debris so that it can right. channel the water like it exactly. needs to go out Exactly, so the it can flow in, it doesn't back up. Um, yeah. It's just kind of knowing what's happening with the stormwater on your street. Okay. Yeah. And when you're out picking up your leaves and debris and putting it in your um, leaf bags, <laughs> if they're city bags or from Ace, wherever you get them from, um, I always encourage residents to pick up the leaves and the debris that's right um, outside of your house on, along your curb, mm -hmm. because if you don't, it'll get washed right down, and that's when we have the pretty significant issues with flooding. Okay. So. You were mentioning off camera that that program is expanding. Tell a little bit about we that. We are. We've been working with Citizen Lab, and because we've looked at other cities, and it's, they've looked to kind of Grand Rapids to see yeah. how that works, and then they've they've gone on and expanded it. So, as I was saying, we work with 23 communities for their stormwater permits, and so they have wanted to expand that into their communities. Yeah. So we're working right now, it's kind of in a beta testing right now to see if it's going to work and a lot, most of the communities have signed up for it. So, and the, the reason we're able to do that is because we have Regis and so we have most of the community's utilities mm -hmm. already on our GIS mapping system. And so it's a matter of um, just getting the information and then there'll be, it's probably, it's not quite there yet. It's gonna take a few more months, but there'll be a big probably public campaign about it and public education. Well, Lipti, and it's probably not necessarily what you know the most about, but City Lab. Tell me, either of you, a little bit mm -hmm. more about that. And, and Citizen how, Lab? Is it Citizen, Citizen Lab? Yep, Citizen right. Lab. They're, they <laughs> are, um, they're fantastic. They, they I, can't, I think they were actually born out of this Code for America brigade. Yes, yes. Okay. So um, years ago when Code for America, it really, people became more familiar with their work and they started getting engaged with cities. Uh, locally, individuals who were tech savvy came together and created brigade, brigades where they would get together and say, okay, what kind of open data do we have that we can utilize to create apps or actually um, make a positive impact, impact on the community by using technology? And they've really expanded. We actually worked with them uh, in June, well, like May and June, uh, and they created a website that had a breakdown of the city budget. So that, mm -hmm. that website that was very interactive that showed our revenue and expenditures and historical expenditures and increases um, and, and was extremely interactive and user friendly, that was actually created by Citizen Lab. All right. With all of our open data. Um, yeah. The city passed an open data policy about a year and a half ago, so they were able to use that data. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's a great group. Yeah, it's okay. awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm, a big, I'm, a, I'm a, a big proponent of... Um, and they're volunteer. And they're volunteer. Yeah, and, and there's incredible expertise and mm -hmm. skills out, skill out there. If we provide the information, it's amazing what people in this space can create. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I would love to see, um, just my thought, a little app that takes you into the base and find, find like a little <laughs> tour <laughs> through <laughs> it to see where it goes. Like a video? <laughs> yeah. We actually yeah. probably yeah. could do yeah. something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> yes. oh, here's what happens when your leaves all yeah. get stuffed in there, yeah. and then here's where they yeah. end up. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so many people don't realize that that goes right into our river. Right. And in fact, it probably was about two or three years ago that as part of the Mayor's River cleanup, we started also going into neighborhoods and doing basin cleanup. So mm -hmm. this year I was, mm -hmm. I was on Indian Mill Creek, but last year I was in a neighborhood cleaning up catch basins mm -hmm. with a huge group of volunteers. Yeah, and you guys were talking about that up at the table yeah. there, that that does go direct, there's no, uh, it's not the treated 
separated at all, tr straight into Correct. the river. And that was the right. whole city's uh, combined sewer separation. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, so cool. a lot of our education um, mm -hmm. in that respect, we have markers that communities can put on their storm drains if you've ever seen them, and it says, you know, dump no waste, drains right to the river. I've seen little fish pictures on some of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. and some of them are cast right in there, yep. so we, a lot of times we'll take school groups out or yeah. groups that want to volunteer and do something, and we'll have them mark the storm drains. Okay. Well, yeah. speaking of so the grand itself yes. in the river, um, uh, big on our, our uh, minds these days is the Restore the Rapids project mm -hmm. and just wondering yes. how that, um, how you see that. We know mm -hmm. a lot about how it's going to kind of affect maybe tourism or the aesthetics and the look of the river and bring it mm -hmm. back to its more natural state, but uh, what about water quality and that sort of thing? Sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the ways that we're involved is we were able to write a grant and we got, it was actually uh, through the USDA and we were able to secure eight million dollars to do habitat restoration in the lower reach of the river. And the reason we were able to get that is uh, we, ha we were able to get 22 community partners to pledge another $8 million mm -hmm. toward that project. So it's a big, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a big administrative uh, <laughs> job right now. But so we, we've been working on um, working with the agencies to get the plans in place to make sure that this habitat restoration is going to do no harm, but then also really make sure that we can improve it, yeah. improve the habitat. You know, mussels are a big issue in the river. I don't know if you've heard about the snuffbox mussel, <laughs> which is our federally endangered uh, species that's in the river. Our endangered um, friends. Our endangered <laughs> friends. And we have seven good other... Good bad mussels uh, that we have to keep these, track and of. These are, these are good mussels, um, and also some uh, threatened mussels and also special concerns. So there's about nine species that we have to really pay attention to in doing this whole project. So um, like I said, it's kind of behind the scenes. We've been working on these plans to submit to agencies to get permission to do the work in the form of permits. Um, but there has been a lot of education and outreach that we've mm -hmm. been doing to try to have people understand the issues. And you know, it might not look that a lot is going on, but we're really hopeful that we can get in the river next summer and at least start working on maybe some of the muscle relocation. Yeah. Um, what does something yeah. like the, um, the Mayor's River cleanup reveal to you mm -hmm. when it comes to what kind of things are ending up that are, are being cleaned up? What do you, right. what do you learn yeah. from that from year to year? You're seeing milk jugs or mm -hmm. this year and ah. these kinds of things the next year and what's happening? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of times people think, you know, it just goes away. Yeah. You just throw <laughs> it and it goes away. <laughs> and uh, it does usually end up in our waterways when you have floods, yeah. like just like catch basins. So they end up there. So. Uh, we look at some of the things I think they find the most are cigarette butts, mm -hmm. uh, coffee cups, bottles, um, a, the, lot a lot, of a bottles. lot of bottles. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, they found a lot of shopping carts. We yeah. find a lot of tires, which are almost some of the legacy mm -hmm. things that you find in there. Um, it, it is pretty amazing what yeah. you can. Fine. We found when a couple go. vacuum yeah, we'll sweepers oh. <laughs> on Saturday. Oh, okay. So we found actually two vacuum sweepers. Uh, and then um, I know folks found bikes. Yeah. They found chair. We found um, one chair. Uh, a lot of broken glass. Mm -hmm. lot, as you said, cigarette butts. But I, mm -hmm. I would say overwhelmingly, the number of bottles, glass bottles, plastic bottles. Yeah. Um, it is. It was. I was stunned. I mean, every year we mm -hmm. find a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you, one year I was out on Placer Creek, and you know, it was blankets, and it was yeah. like people just dumped bags of garbage mm -hmm. along the river. Uh, it, and so, you know, for pe for people that do need access to um, to, to trash removal, mm -hmm. we have a program for that. We work in partnership with community um, with Asset. So if you're mm -hmm. low income and you can't afford refuse pickup. Please contact the city. Tires so are probably under that as well because there's a big well, we, fee for that. Yeah, well, we yeah. work for, with the county mm -hmm. um, through their recycling program for a lot of the bigger items, uh, and they do a lot of recycling education. So uh, even televisions and I, didn't, I we didn't find any big appliances this year, mm. but I know they have in the past, yeah. uh, especially old televisions. So the county has a recycling program to, for that. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's just getting that awareness. You know why? Yeah. Why just think if we didn't have the bottle bill or mm -hmm. you know, all the right. recycling of how much might yeah get in there yeah but yeah that was great it's a it's a Wemiac supported event yes and it, it draws huge crowds and I think yeah. it gets bigger and bigger every year I think it's so. because you yeah. have the word beer in yeah <laughs> that does help you know it, that is, always a great, helps. it is a great day I uh, we had well over I would say a thousand volunteers 
and uh, I haven't heard the final numbers of how many tons we picked up, oh. but um, each year it seems to be getting larger, mm -hmm. which is astonishing. Like I think of how much trash we picked up last year. Right, and, and you think, when, when will we not have to do this? Yes, but yeah. 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 Uh, but then there more again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And then right. afterward, we all come back to Sixth Street mm -hmm. Park, and there's pizza, and there's um, mm -hmm. Subway, and lunch, and then um, there's a local band, uh, and then a beer tent. So it's, mm -hmm. it's just a really fun day mm -hmm. um, after getting out there and sweating and getting dirty. And I got <laughs> bit all over by mosquitoes. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Next year I'm going to remember to bring mosquito spray. Yeah. Um, but it's a really great day. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, Wendy, I want to ask you a little bit, just um, mm -hmm. with uh, maybe two to three minutes left. Looking ahead, what are, you, what are some of the, the goals that you have? I mean, well, right now for Elgro, it's time to redo our strategic plan. Um, the goals are pretty much the same. We work on healthy watersheds, public engagement, and just making sure we have a robust organization. So right now we're in the process of just updating with some of the accomplishments. Did we meet our goals and trying to look at that? Um, so we are with the, with the river restoration, just keep plugging away on mm -hmm. that, hopefully submitting the permit soon so we can get in the river. Uh, we do have two events coming up that I'd like to mention. We have on September 13th, which is this Thursday, yeah, this week. at Richmond Park. We're having just a free end of summer celebration. It's called the Watershed Jamboree. Mm -hmm. um, but we have some live music. We have free hot dogs. And it's really all about connecting with your local watershed. So we have representatives from all of those sub-watersheds. And so when people come, they can kind of find out where they live in relation to the watershed and maybe how to get involved and do something. We have tons of kids' activities, uh, so it should be really a fun day. Mm -hmm. It's going to be 80 degrees. It's going to be beautiful, so Great. come out for that. For that at Wonderful Park? time. Richmond Park. Okay. Um, All day long? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, from 4.30 to 6.30. Okay. So come on out and have some dinner and listen yeah. to music and have fun. And then um, on October 10th, it's the International Imagine a Day Without Water. And so we are hosting a water trivia night at Harmony Hall. So public is invited, and we have lots of questions regarding water prizes. Um, so that is from 6 to 8 at Harmony yeah. Hall on October 10th. Yeah, great. And some of the questions about the Grand River will probably be on that trivia yeah. night. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, and I should say one other thing um, about Grand Valley Metro Council and the Regis and the GIS system. There's a, a huge push throughout the state looking at infrastructure and asset management and um, our community, largely because of Grand Valley Metro Council, has been held up as an example mm -hmm. because we have the data where we have mapped out the infrastructure and I don't think people realize a lot of communities do not have that and they, they don't no have idea. it easily no accessible <laughs> and they don't have it electronically <laughs> right. and it really puts our community in a in a good place to do mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. the Basin Buddy and other right. things because we have this data and infrastructure. Um, so again, I think there's a lot of thing that, things that Grand Valley Metro Council and Algro does that people just don't know about and I just want to say thank you right. for your work. Thank you. Great. Well, Wendy, thanks thank for having you for being me. Yeah, here um, me. with Grand Valley Metro Council, Director of Education Programs, uh, telling us quite a bit about Elgro. Did I get yeah. any of that correct? Some, yes. Some of that. <laughs> <laughs> some some of that. Uh, that's fine. And then two dates for some great events coming mm -hmm. up. That's this Thursday, September 13th at Richmond Park, and mm -hmm. then on October 10th at Harmony Hall. So right. Some great right. opportunities so for some education there. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for being here. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. And thanks. with City Connection, we'll be right back after this break. I'm excited to announce that the Healthy Body, Healthy Mind 5K will take place Saturday, September 22nd at Riverside Park in Grand Rapids. Hosted by Mind Meets Music, this 5K walk and run is free for families in the Grand Rapids area. Mind Meets Music reaches approximately 5,000 underserved kids in over 30 Kent County schools using musical interventions to enhance brain development and help improve math, literacy, and other important skills. While the program's main focus is academic achievement and social-emotional learning, we believe it is important to nurture the development of the whole child. So this event will promote overall health and wellness for our kids and their families. A healthy body and healthy mind will help our children succeed. This walk and run will offer a 5K and one mile options to accommodate all ages and abilities. 
We encourage all family members and friends to participate, respecting their own physical cap capabilities and comfort. Joining us will be various organizations such as Cherry Health and Grand Rapids Public Library, who will be sharing valuable resources. There will be a raffle with prizes, including four all-access passes to Rebounders Grand Rapids and Catch Air. Thank you to our sponsors, Meyer, the Center for Physical Rehabilitation, SNC Plastic Coatings, Boxed Water, Store Printing, and Old Orchards for making this event possible. If you would like to get involved, there are still volunteer and sponsorship opportunities, as well as space for community organizations to host information booths. Bring the family and invite your neighbors to come out to Riverside Park for the Healthy Body, Healthy Mind 5K on Saturday, September 22nd. Registration begins at 9 a.m. with a warm-up led by AM Yoga at 9.45, before walkers and runners take off at 10 a.m. You must register for this free event at mindmeetsmusic.com slash HBHM5K or by calling 616-419-4329. Don't forget to register. In the meantime, for a chance to experience the Mind Meets Music program with your kids firsthand, join us at the Grand Rapids Public Library every Tuesday and Thursday from 6 to 6.30 p.m. starting September 11th. Follow us on Facebook to learn more about the 5K and about joining us at the Grand Rapids Public Library. Search for Mind Meets Music on Facebook and learn more. Welcome back to City Connection. Our thanks to Wendy Ogilvy. And we did get a question that relates to Grand Valley Metro Council as she left. So Mayor, she uh, filled your ear with some of the details of it, but the question is from Stacy, and it says, what is Grand Valley Metro Council? Is it a government yeah. body? How is it funded? Yeah. When do you feel you a little bit in on that? And you know a bit yourself, sitting on that board. Yeah, so it's, uh, so it's enabled through state legislation and it's a, um, I wouldn't call it quasi-judicial, but it's a, it's a standalone organization made up of multiple units of government. Any unit of government that gets federal transportation dollars, we have to be a member of Grand Valley Metro Council because the recommendations for those, how those federal dollars mm -hmm. are spent and the communities that they go to are made through the Metro Council. And then we as members of Grand Valley Metro Council, like for Regis, we pay a fee to the Metro Council to support their work. Okay. So, all and right. there's, there's, um, it's all types of government. So the counties, counties around the table, um, multiple counties, Ottawa County, Kent County, there are townships, there are villages, there are cities. Um, and so it truly is a multi-jurisdictional body. Okay. But it's, it's regional. So that there's, it's a pretty large region. I think the board has like 44 members. Wow. Yeah. It's a very, it's a large board. Okay. And well, subcommittees and it's, I learned quite a bit about that extensive. today. That was, yeah. that was a, a quick peek into Grand Valley Metro Council through your conversation with yeah. Wendy. Yeah. Interesting. Well, this is the question and answer section of it. And we do have another question. Then we've got a couple other topics, Mary, we're going okay. to cover. But um, in the Q&A section, the first question has to do with some changes going on at Wealthy Street. And then this is from Tom. And he says, got a notice in his mailbox last month about meters being inso installed on Wealthy. He says he lives on the street, has lived there for many years, and uh, rely on street parking. Is there a way to park there without getting uh, towed or fined? How does it? Uh, how are residents to handle this? Yeah. So, um, so there, especially in business districts like Uptown or mm -hmm. Wealthy Street, Bridge Street, um, for those business districts, we are putting in some parking meters. And I don't have the full plan with me, but. Um, if anyone wants access to that, our director of mobility, Josh, can provide that. Uh, so during the day, there will be hours similar to downtown Grand Rapids where those meters will be enforced. And then there will be times during the day where they're not enforced. Uh, and so hopefully all of that information was shared. I know parking is, is incredibly challenging. We're seeing that more and more in some of our neighborhoods. In fact, we just at our last city commission meeting, we heard a request by the neighbors of Belknap, Look, Belknap Lookout mm -hmm. to expand their resident parking permit program. I know that there are other neighborhoods throughout the city that are looking at that to ensure that there are spaces for residents to park. Uh, and I know that there's more information coming out about that. Noble was our first kind of pilot with that, and we've learned a lot. We've made some changes to the program to make it easier, particularly for um, residents and when they have visitors. Uh, so we're trying to find that balance. You know, we really want vibrant neighborhood business districts, and we know that a lot of folks uh, will park in neighborhoods 
and but we also know that we want to make sure that residents have access to parking, particularly if they don't have a have a driveway or a, an alley. Okay, so you said that information, of course, would be on the website, but city yeah, again. And yeah, hopefully on the notice that was given, there's oh, okay. contact information if you have additional questions. If not, call my office and I'll connect you to the right person. Sounds good. Yeah, a lot of changes. Um, mm -hmm. We have. Um, Part of our organization's wealthy theater meters went up there last yes. week, so I think they uh, they kick in this week. And just yeah. seeing how much further they're coming up Bridge Street with all yeah. the activity here, it's a, it is a sign of yeah. success in a in, in a, a large way. It is that balance. You'll see them on Cherry Street. I know I got a call about that, so you'll see them in in a number of neighborhood business districts. Okay. Yeah. Well, thinking of all the activity that's coming up, we have our prize kicking off pretty oh, yeah. soon, and huh? that will um, create some parking challenges too. But let's just talk <laughs> about the the yeah. impact of our prize, and now that it's an every other year sort of thing, actually it's every yeah. year, but it changes from what it is each year. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> what's happening this year? What, what yeah. do you see as far as um, you mentioned you're already starting to see some of the art outside downtown. Yes, and I'm sure others will too. Um, so, so this year will be a really fun year. It's the 10 year celebration. I think uh, you'll have a lot of opportunity to get engaged and celebrate 10 years of Art Prize. There's gonna be a little bit different uh, I should say different setup down on Rosa Park Circle. So there'll be a huge tent that's put out there and there will be activities and things going on pretty much every day, all day at Rosa Park Circle. Uh, and so that will be a little bit different this year. So I think this year it's gonna be a highlight of the best of the best of what we've had in the past. Um, and then as they move to this every other year kind of art prize model and then looking at odd years, as um, what they're calling project one, project mm -hmm. two. I think there's a lot of potential with that. Um, I think there's a lot of questions still on how that will be different and what it will look like. Uh, but I think, you know, change sometimes is good. I know some people have shared with me concern about the economic impact on the community. Um, but I think people had concerns when Art Prize was launched 10 years ago and it, it has seems been- to have evolved every year. Yeah. There's, there are tweaks, changes, modifications yeah. each year as uh, the yeah. lived experience kind of informs it. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I'm really excited to see um, what next year holds, but I'm really excited for this year. I think we'll see a lot of people coming in. I know they're bringing back some of the folks who have won in the past to speak. Um, it's a great lineup if you haven't looked at it. Uh, you know, pretty much every day something awesome is going on. So take a look at the, at the agenda and figure out where you wanna go when. Okay. Yeah. A couple other things going on. A um, couple things you mentioned to me I wasn't quite aware of. Lead Free Kids Advisory yeah. Committee or yes. project. Tell me a little bit about what's going on there. Yeah, so this has been uh, something I've been working on actually for a number of months. I talked about it at my State of the City um, back in February. Um, so if you don't know, um, we were uh, incredibly disappointed to see that both in 2015 and 2016, we actually had a pretty significant uptick mm -hmm. in the number of children who live in our city who tested positive for lead. Uh, the count, the state had a task force that they put together under Lieutenant Governor Kelly last year. I actually served on that. And then mid-year last year, the county um, put in place a county-wide task force looking at what the county can do around um, preventing, testing, um, educating people about lead poisoning. And then when the report from the county came out earlier this year, they presented in front of the full commission, I believe in April. Shortly after that, um, I put together a city-specific um, lead-free kids advisory committee looking specifically at city ordinances, city policy, city practice around lead remediation and what we can do to um, be more aggressive, um, but then also really try to address this issue of lead poisoning in children. So we had our first meeting last month. Um, we're also working with a scientist out of Chicago who is um, working with three cities actually and looking at their ordinances and um, policies and procedures and then pairing them and comparing them to um, best practices in other cities. And so that research is going to be done in about three to four months. And then the advisory committee will review that and make recommendations for changes at, at City Hall. Okay, so yeah, your disappointment with the kind of the trending in the wrong direction yeah. most recently, most of us think of water as the source because yeah. we've heard so much about what's going on in Michigan. Not so much the case here, no. it has more to do 
there were uh, lead removal from paint programs that uh, funding has kind of uh, been exhausted at this yeah. point, and is that where a lot of it comes from with house paints? Or? Yeah, the, so the vast majority of children being poisoned, it's because of lead paint in homes, okay. um, lead dust, I, uh, you know, when you, if you live in a home that was built before 1978, it's very, very likely that there's lead paint, um, both on the walls and around the windows. Um, so we still do have money, actually. We have HUD money, um, over $2 million, and we do, we have a, a robust lead remediation program that we do in partnership with Healthy Homes, um, but it's, it, it clearly just isn't enough. And then if you look at the data, um, we have three neighborhoods and three zip codes, 49507 being the worst, and then 03 and 04, where we have high concentrations of kids being poisoned. So we're really looking at those areas and what we can do um, to provide education, information, testing, and then um, remediation if needed. Thinking of 04 specifically, because that's where we are right here, okay. um, a lot of construction, yeah. a lot of demolition sometimes ends up putting lead into the environment, yeah. into the ground. Do we know if that has any role in this? Yeah, so, I mean, there's uh, there's some theories about why we're seeing an uptick, and one of them is that with the housing boom um, and the economy improving, people are doing more uh, renovations on their home, okay. and they're not using lead-safe practices. So there's a whole process for contractors uh, and people working on homes to go through and get certified so that they know how to do renovations where there's lead. And so the concern is, is that as you have this increase in home renovations, um, folks aren't using those uh, lead safe practices. Okay. And then we'll end with one more thing, a little bit on the subject, but um, you said you just came in from an Energy Advisory Committee yeah. uh, meeting. What is that all about? And we've got yeah. maybe two minutes, a minute and a half. All right. Yeah, so uh, so energy, um, getting to 100% renewable energy is uh, continues to be a goal at the city, and we've done a lot of work internally. Uh, we had, for a number of years, an Energy Advisory Committee that was largely internal and city staff. Uh, and so when we brought on Allison Sutter as our uh, sustainability manager, I wanted to take a fresh look at our committees and expand them and have it be uh, more driven by community and have more community members around the table, particularly community members who are experts in the space around renewable energy and energy sustainability um, to help advise us and help us get to our goals. So we put together uh, an advisory committee of about 24 um, folks um, from all different areas, from law, from different companies that are doing great work, nonprofit organizations, uh, and uh, we've been meeting, we've had three meetings so far, and uh, I'm really excited to have their expertise. Even earlier today at our meeting, we were talking about some of the goals around analyzing the potential for solar and LED lights, and they had really great input as we, as a city commission and also at the city, look at these options. Great, lots of great information yeah. and um, exciting things as we move ahead. Our prize coming up, a lot of things to look forward to. Uh, Mayor Bliss, thanks for being here again for this month's thanks. edition of uh, City Connection. We adjusted one week because of the holidays, yeah. so we're a week later. Next month, it is October 1st, and I believe you'll have, um, you've invited Ruth Kelly, Commissioner yes. Kelly, to sit in for you next month. Yes. So we'll be uh, back here on October 1st for the next edition of City Connection. I'm Linda Galash with Community Media Center. Uh, thank you again, Mayor yeah. Bliss, and thank our you. thanks to Wendy Ogilvie with uh, Grand Valley Metro Council, Elgro, and all the things she does there. Thanks again. Uh -huh.